Well, welcome back to our next session here at the retreat conference at Montreal College. Our cyber program is, is changing rapidly. And as of Wednesday of this week, we've added a new concentration to our MBA. And so our Masters of Business Administration starting this coming fall will include a concentration option in cybersecurity management. And so uh, we have the link there. If you'd like some more information, I'd ask you to be patient because this is, this is uh, just 48 hours old. And so uh, it'll be up on our web here soon, but you can see uh, a link to uh, our cyber program soon. It's my pleasure to, to introduce Rodney Peterson for our next session. Rodney is the director of NICE, which is, isn't that a great title, a director of NICE? which is the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, which is part of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Recently, he was president and CEO of Educational Policy and Leadership, LLC, and he previously served as a senior policy advisor to Educause, Internet2, and Indiana University. He was also the managing director of Educause's, Educause's Washington office and the senior government relations officer there. He received a law degree from Wake Forest University and a certificate as an advanced graduate specialist in education policy, planning, and administration from the University of Maryland. Rodney holds a bachelor's degree in business administration and another one in political science from Alma College. Today he's speaking about Growing and Sustaining the Cybersecurity Workforce, Partnership Between Industry, Government, and Academia. Let's welcome Rodney. Thank you so much, Greg. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, as Greg mentioned in the introduction, I am known as the nice guy on campus, which is both a pleasure to have that title, but it's also a pretty heavy expectation, particularly when you're introduced as a demon deacon in what might be hostile territory, depending on your allegiance here in the state of North Carolina. But it is great to be back. Thanks to Greg and President Maurer and all the staff here for the invitation to come to speak. Uh, to be honest with you, when a few months ago I got the invitation to come to Western North Carolina in the end of October, it didn't take me long to say absolutely uh, because of all that's around us here outside and certainly driving down yesterday was no disappointment in being on this beautiful campus today. Many of the speakers already have started to steal my thunder a little bit because I want to start by saying that the vision of NICE, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, is about the people that you've been hearing a lot about this morning. We talk about this digital economy that is enabled by a knowledgeable and skilled cybersecurity workforce. So you begin to immediately see the theme of people being an important part of the solution. But let me also not underscore the importance of technology and process. We tend to think about people, process, and technology as the ingre ingredients that need to go together. So from a risk management perspective, many of you may use a various definition of something like threats times vulnerabilities times impact really define the risk that you're facing in IT, cybersecurity, or whatever the field might be. And in cybersecurity, the threats tend to refer to the bad actors or the people or the nation states, the hackers, the criminals, all the rest. And quite frankly, it's very difficult to control or do anything about them. They're going to exist, they're going to try, they're going to continue to persist and cause you harm. Vulnerabilities refers to the weaknesses or the flaws in systems or networks or people that allow the bad actors to penetrate and to undermine your cybersecurity. So when you think about vulnerabilities, you have a larger ability to control and influence what you do with respect to vulnerabilities. And of course, impact talks about what's the actual consequence, what's the probability, what's the likelihood of harm happening. And, and just one quick story um, this morning, uh, actually yesterday driving through Virginia, we drove through kind of some areas that aren't exactly along Route 81 just to see the countryside. And there was a huge Merck plant, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company, uh, has a headquarters or a warehouse and facility there in Virginia. 
my wife's father worked for Merck for over 30 years. And so we inherited some stock from her father, which I got the little phone alert today that that stock is going down 4% today. So if any of you are Merck stockholders, if you get up and leave right now, I totally understand. I'm, I'm bringing that up because you know why Merck stock is going down 4% today? Because of a cyber attack that they had in June that impacted their revenues, their profitability. And so actually they had some increase in sales based upon some new drugs and things that they were doing, but the cyber attack negatively influenced their bottom line. And again, as we think about the vulnerabilities that companies and organizations and governments need to address, we do need to address the technology. We need to address the process. We need to address a workforce that's knowledgeable and skilled. And by the way, this isn't just cybersecurity professionals or IT professionals. This is everybody in the workforce. That's why this month of October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's about awareness and action for everybody, for citizens, for consumers, for employees, for your university faculty, staff, and students here at Montreat College, because we need to make sure that entire workforce is knowledgeable and skilled. But in cybersecurity, we have a very specific interest in these professionals or practitioners who are going to hone their credentials through academic degrees, through certifications, through experience to play a very important role in protecting our networks. And that part of the people or the workforce is what we're mostly focused on. The way that NICE does this is trying to promote a robust network across the United States and quite frankly increasingly internationally to energize and promote this network so that it's an integrated system of cybersecurity education, training and workforce development. Now this may seem obvious, but we are a large nation, even your own state is a large state, and I suspect if you tried to just come up here in the next hour and define all the things happening across the state of North Carolina from state government to local government to industry to academia, you would have a lot to list, a lot of activities and uh, initiatives to share. But increasingly, a lot of those initiatives and activities are synergistic, if not duplicative. And so a lot of what we do is introduce one party to another party who's trying to do similar things so that we create this ecosystem that's collectively working together to solve what many of you understand and know to be a national problem. Now, I want to share with you just some of our goals from the NICE strategic plan that, by the way, was required from Congress by way of the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act of 2014. So NICE, even though it's a program in the U.S. Department of Commerce, specifically the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is a program that's both interagency, meaning we work across the government, starting with the White House, Department of Homeland Security, NSA, by the way, congratulations on your designation as a center of academic excellence coming from those two organizations, but also with the National Science Foundation, Department of Education, and others. And so that Cybersecurity Enhancement Act not only kind of instantiated our work, created some expectations, but required a strategic plan. And then secondly, we work as a public-private partnership very closely with uh, K-12 schools, colleges, universities, and industry as well. So our strategic plan has three goals, and I really want to emphasize this first one because it's not the most obvious and probably not the one that colleges and universities tend to worry about the most. Because despite the great work that you'll all do here at Montreat or down the road at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte or Chapel Hill or NC State or many other institutions, all of those students graduating from bachelor's and uh, master's degrees alone are not going to address the cybersecurity workforce shortage. In a moment, I'll give you some very specific data across the country and in North Carolina. And so what we also need to think about is how do we create an additional workforce, including transitioning veterans, people who are in their careers who want to change careers, or even high school students and others that we can move through the process of education and training more rapidly. And so this first goal is about this sense of urgency in both the public, the federal government, state government, as well as the private sector, academia and industry, to make sure that we have an intensely increased focus on addressing this cybersecurity workforce shortage. And the way we're gonna do that is accelerating learning and skills development. 
And so one example are apprenticeship programs, which many of you may think about as something that's only for the technical trades or it's really not for professionals or people who do IT. But think about the opportunity for a company or an employer to hire a high school student or a college student or somebody who's in you know, the middle of their career who has the ability or the capacity to do cybersecurity work and they actually earned as they learned. In other words, they could actually go into the workplace, start to do the work, and they would get the training or the education or the on-the-job experience while they're doing it. It's that kind of creativity that we're seeing with apprenticeships now going from just the technical trades into professional roles like IT and cybersecurity. Or what if we started taking high schools, as I'm sure you do in this state already or experimenting with, and started introducing community college course contents to students at the junior level so that they graduate as a senior in high school with a high school diploma and associate degree and maybe even some cybersecurity certifications so that they can get into the workforce more quickly and possibly to continue to pursue a bachelor's or a master's degree at a later date. So this first goal is really critically important because it emphasizes that higher education alone, as important as it will be to the long-term success of our cybersecurity workforce needs, is not going to address our needs in the near term and maybe even in the medium term. But our second goal does really reinforce the important role that Montreat College and other colleges and universities play as part of this diverse learning community. And you know, the, the first thing you might think of in terms of diverse learning community, many of you may have heard of upstairs when the panel discussion was talking about, you know, why given the female population, not only in the United States and in the workforce, but in a typical educational setting, which is 50% or more, why is there only 10 or 11% in the cybersecurity workforce? Or why are there only six or 7% of ethnic minorities who are working in cybersecurity? And so increasing the diversity is not only an opportunity in terms of underrepresented populations, but it's really necessary, again, as we heard people talk about upstairs, it's not only diversity of gender, diversity of ethnicity, it's diversity of culture, it's diversity of experience, it's diversity of thought. It's really the kind of team you wanna create where not everybody's the same and thinks the same way. And so that is one aspect of diversity, but the other aspect of this diverse learning community is to think about who is providing and facilitating learning uh, for our students and for our employees. Of course, it's K through 12 schools. Of course, it's community colleges. Of course, it's colleges and universities and graduate schools. But it's also increasingly training and certification organizations. It's employers who are providing in-house training. And collectively, this community not only needs to be better integrated so that there's a clear pathway from one step to the other, but they're also respected and understood that they all play an important part of this comprehensive process which is, as this goal in, indicates, emphasizes learning, measures outcomes, and begins to set the expectation. If you're coming into cybersecurity, it's not get a degree, get a certification, and you're done. You've got to continuously learn. You've got to have the capacity, the ability to be a lifelong learner. And a lot of that training or education or experience or expectation is coming from a variety of ways, but we need to, in cybersecurity, understand that this is a lifelong learning skill that we need to nurture and develop. And then the third goal in our strategic plan talks about guiding uh, career development and workforce planning. And we are working closely both within the federal government as well as the private sector with those who do the hiring. So it's not only hiring managers, but it could be recruiters, and it certainly could be human resources departments to make sure that we're beginning to give them the tools, the information, the skills that are necessary to do the things we call recruitment, hiring, development, and retention, kind of the holistic HR life cycle uh, for employees of the future. Now, within the federal government, we've done some pretty serious things, including, as I'll talk about in a moment, we have a law, another federal law that requires our HR departments to make sure that their existing workforce as well as the future workforce are aligned to something called the NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. And not only is that a legal requirement for them to align it, but it begins to influence how job descriptions are written. And again, I heard this discussion upstairs earlier this morning. And so the Department of Homeland Security has developed a tool, it's called the Push Button Position Description Tool 
that allows hiring managers or HR to jo write job descriptions that are based upon the NICE workforce framework. And that fundamentally starts with identifying tasks or things that need to be done and performed. And then from that to determine what the knowledge, skills, and abilities are. And quite frankly, even as important as your work here in giving students degrees is, or getting certifications might be, the academic credential or the certification credential in and of itself isn't evidence of competency or proficiency. So in the federal government, even though a lot of people assume, well, you gotta have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree to advance, the equivalent attainment of KSAs or experience and those type of skills make you eligible for a job in the federal government. Now, what that means is academic institutions, your degree needs to have a value. It needs to have, as we heard this morning, a business case for why employers see it as something they want to bring students in with. But much like that first goal talked about, we're gonna have students coming out of high school without a college degree that are gonna be far ahead in terms of skills and knowledge than that student who just finished a master's degree or a PhD. So we're really trying to keep the focus on knowledge and skills and bring along with academic institutions and certification providers because a couple of the key things that cut through our strategy is hands-on learning so that it's not just head knowledge or book knowledge but it's the actual ability to apply what you learn and secondly is performance-based assessments that we can begin to much like your assessment word up here be able to validate and show that the student's not just a good test taker, but they actually can apply what they've learned, that the skills that they've developed can be applied in a real world setting. One example of the way we're trying to encourage that is NICE has funded something called the NICE Challenge Project, which is being developed and run by California State University in San Bernardino, that takes our NICE framework task and puts them into a virtual learning environment where faculty and students here at Montreat College or other colleges and universities in your state can give access to your students to be a part of that platform and that learning environment where really what we're looking at is the outcome of the ability to do the work. And in some cases, faculty use that as a teaching tool. They may give a class lecture and say, go and apply this. In other cases, they're saying, here's the tool, go figure it out and let's come back in class and talk about it. And even though the last may seem a little ironic to why would you give them something to do without telling them how to do it, welcome to the real world, right? In cybersecurity, you're presented with a problem and you gotta figure out how to solve it. And the way you figure out how to solve it is kinda on your own or talking to peers, and then maybe you come back in the staff meeting or in this case, the class, and you talk collectively about how you got to the solution and what you can learn from that. So I mentioned I was gonna talk about jobs and demand, and I'll start with just some data at the national level. So uh, if you're not aware, there's a website called CyberSeek, cyberseek.org, and it is uh, powered by Burning Glass Technologies who has the analytic capability to look at job announcements, not only in cybersecurity, but a variety of career fields. And then we partnered with CompTIA, who as you'll see in a moment, has supplied some data with respect to certifications, not just from CompTIA, but many of the other major cybersecurity certification providers and then NICE and NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, funds this project, and we announced it a year ago. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, we will be having the annual NICE conference and expo in Ohio. We'll be announcing some upgrades and updates to this, but at a basic level, you'll see that as of August, when we last updated this, there are 299,335 open jobs in cybersecurity in the U.S. Now, you may think, oh, that's less than I expected. I'm hearing millions, I'm hearing, you know, big, big um, digits of available jobs. So another data point that's often discussed is the ISC Square Global Information Security Workforce Study that projects by 2022, there'll be 1.8 million open cybersecurity jobs globally. So two things to be aware of. One is that is a global number, this is a US number. And two, their data is survey data. And so I know there's a few of you in here who do IT security, cybersecurity for a living. And if I asked you the question of how many cybersecurity people you think you'll need in 22 or 22 or how many do you want, you would give me this number. When I said, how many of them can you write job descriptions for and hire today? Your number's gonna be here. I mean, that's the reality. And this is the number here, which is still pretty high, 
but it's not how many in an ideal state. Now, again, don't get me wrong, the bottom number here is the number of people in the workforce around 750,000. We expect that's gonna continue to grow. You know, our goal over time is to reduce the open jobs, but the point is, this data looks across all job boards, all job announcements, even anticipates things like an intern getting hired a job that's not posted or internal realignment and projects. There's still 300,000 jobs open currently, and that's a pretty big number. Now, I'll come back to this in a moment, but the reason this is important is that not only does it give us a sense of what the demand is, but we need to start thinking more carefully about, well, what does that 300,000 number represent? And so this is where the nice cybersecurity workforce framework comes into play. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have heard of the NICE framework? Okay, so maybe about a quarter of the hands in the room. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many of you think it's the same as the NIST framework, because it's not. So the NIST framework for securing critical infrastructure is something separate but complementary, because the NIST framework that talks about why and how to do cybersecurity, and maybe a little bit of what, this is who's going to do it, right? So the NICE framework is, you know, where's the workforce going to come from to make all those things happen? And so you see in these colored boxes along the top, we began to define it through seven broad categories of work. And the first thing to recognize is this is not a homogeneous profession where there's just one single description of what it means to be a cybersecurity professional. There's seven broad categories of work. And so as you've heard already here today, Things like interdisciplinary degrees or varieties of background and experiences is just really perfectly suited for these seven categories. You know, just to give you one example, this category in blue, the third one from the left here, oversee and govern, that's where I've lived in most of my career. So as you heard in the introduction, I have a business degree, a political science degree, a law degree, you know, nothing technical other than some experience along the way that would have prepared me, but my first job in cybersecurity was at the University of Maryland College Park where I was writing policies on cybersecurity. I was doing training and awareness in cybersecurity. In fact, at that time, we didn't really have a cybersecurity program, so we helped to build the information security program. I was doing compliance. A lot of things that my law degree, my business degree, my political science degree allowed me to do. And if I were labeling the category of work today, it would be in that oversee and govern category. Another category here that may look familiar is this notion of protecting and defending right in the middle. I mean, that's kind of core cybersecurity, and that's a lot of what the NIST framework talks about is, you know, how do we protect and defend our networks and our systems? And, and there certainly is a lot of action there, as you'll see in a moment. That is not where the most jobs are, however. There is a lot of action there that's not the most jobs. But just the final example I want to use with respect to these categories is the far left talks about securely provisioned. So I, I would maybe say a little differently than earlier speakers. People are important. Process is important. Technology is important. All three are important. But guess who develops the processes? People. Guess who develops the technology and operates it? People. Securely provision talks about a couple things. One is who's developing the technology we're using. Because remember when I talked about vulnerabilities, our biggest vulnerabilities are flaws in networks and systems and applications. And somebody along the way either introduced that flaw or didn't fix it as it was being developed. And then secondly, we also have the reality that in this day and age, whether you're a small, medium business or whether you're a large company, and you want to source to a third party the provisioning of IT, whether it's cloud computing, whether it's third party hosting, whether it's ex external uh, sourcing, you are developing contracts and agreements and relationships with a third party. They're provisioning your IT. And now you've got lawyers and contract and procurement and other professionals who are doing securely provisioned. They're not writing software. They're not architecting systems. They're not developing uh, infrastructure but they are bringing it to your organization in the same way somebody who is writing software or developing code is. So just to illustrate, it's a very broad area of work. And, and I said I was only gonna talk about the three, but I do wanna just quickly mention on the far right, investigate. You know, 
Security breaches happen, incidents happen, and digital forensics is a reality that we need people to investigate and deal with these issues. So the framework goes from these seven categories into 32 or 33 specialty areas. And again, it begins to refine a little more specifically, you know, what might a cybersecurity career look like? In fact, a lot of academic institutions that are part of the Centers of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity that NSA and DHS host, you know, begin to build program focus areas around these specialty areas because, you know, we don't need everybody across the nation just being generic cybersecurity professionals, particularly for larger organizations. We want specialists. We want people who are a little deeper uh, and not just wide in cybersecurity areas. And so these specialty areas begin to define that. And then the final thing with respect to this framework, which by the way, was published just in August of 2017 for the first time as a NIST special publication. It had been around for a few years as kind of a more informal publication. Uh, we added work roles to it. And what work roles really does, and by the way, there's over 50 work roles, it begins to underscore what I've been saying all along, that cybersecurity increasingly is everyone's responsibility. And you may not have a cybersecurity title, it may not even be part of your job description, but at least within the federal government, if you're spending 25% or more of your time on tasks that are in this framework, then you have a cybersecurity work role. So that contract employee who's doing contracts or procurement with third parties that spends most of their day asking about the security and what kind of um, products and services they're bringing into your environment. They may be called a contract specialist, but now they have a work role that's called a cybersecurity work role. And I think we'll see increasingly the importance of this, not that they all need cybersecurity degrees, but they may need training. They may need supervision. They may need their performance uh, process to be accountable for things that are both a part, part of this framework and the over-organizational responsibility. So anyway, this nice framework is a way that both the government working with academia and industry have tried to develop a common taxonomy, a lexicon, a way to define cybersecurity work. So we're not just throwing out this broad term that doesn't have any meaning. One caveat I would give you though is as broad as it may seem to be, it is not everything. It's not all IT jobs. It's not all cyber jobs. I often challenge people when they say cyber, what do you mean? Do you mean cyberspace? Do you mean cyber related? Do you mean IT? This is a framework for cybersecurity job that is largely overlapping with IT. It certainly overlaps significantly with cyber. It also overlaps significantly with STEM. But it's not the same as STEM because a lot of these categories you see up here are not STEM programs. They're not STEM degrees. They're not STEM jobs and careers. So why is this helpful back to CyberSeq is because now we can take those jobs and those 299,000 jobs, we can say, well, where are the jobs with respect to these seven categories of work? And the one category that I didn't talk about, which is the number one here, is operate and maintain. Almost 200,000 of the open jobs is in operate and maintain. Operate and maintain looks a lot like an IT job. So it might be a system administrator. It might be a network administrator. It might be a database administrator. And guess what? When I was at the University of Maryland, we're like, you know, we don't have a chief information security officer. We don't have a program. Let's get the right people together within the IT organization and on campus to talk about this. Guess who we brought to the table? The network administrators, the system administrators, the database administrators, all those who significantly touch upon cybersecurity and so these may not look like cybersecurity jobs, but they have significant cybersecurity responsibilities or work roles, and not surprisingly, it's the number one category. Securely provision. Probably wouldn't have been the first thing that came to your mind, but you can see that's the second area where cybersecurity jobs are available. By the way, I would add that I think that area is not only important, but will become increasingly important for a couple of reasons. One is when you think about automation, a lot of people say, well, these numbers are going to go down, jobs are going to go away because we're going to automate cybersecurity. And the answer is probably yes, to some degree, the categories, the jobs are going to shift because what a person has to do today, a machine will do in the future. But that machine or that program, guess what, has to be developed and created and innovated securely by somebody. 
And so some of those jobs will shift into securely provisioning. The second example is the Internet of Things, which you've heard a lot about already. And when you think about all the Internet connected devices, that's great. It's going to make my life, our lives so much better and so much simpler until it's not secure by design. And so we need the creators and the innovators of all these internet connected devices part of this securely provisioned workforce. And you'll see how that will increase over time. So back to CyberSeq. So in addition to job demand, because we partnered with CompTIA, we also worked with them to take a look across some of the major certification organizations to see where's the supply coming from. And if you know a little bit about certifications, you know that Security Plus may be one of the basic certifications. Quite frankly, a lot of high school students obtain it, community college students, even non-IT or cybersecurity folks. And you'll see that there's almost 170,000 people with that certification out there, and yet only 33,000 of the jobs require it. Now that's, that's a good thing. I mean, that may imply an oversupply, but as a basic you know, certification, it's okay. But if you go further down the list, you'll see things like CISSP, where 76,000 jobs in that 299,000 open require a CISSP, and yet the number of people with CISSPs are 69,000. And presumably, a lot of those 69,000 people are already in jobs, right? So this isn't people who are you know, waiting to take a job with a CISSP. So this begins to give us an indication of where the supply and the demand kind of come together. But again, with one little caveat, is just because the job description requires it doesn't mean it's a good thing or that it's in fact necessary. And part of our underlying goal in CyberSeq is not only to provide this data, but back to that ecosystem is to influence that ecosystem so that people start to increasingly write job descriptions that are focused on knowledge, skills, abilities, not just degrees or certifications or things that may or may not alone measure a student's competence or proficiency. So what about North Carolina? If you haven't taken a look at CyberSeq, you'll see there are 10,000 open jobs in North Carolina in cybersecurity. I don't know what your perspective is. From mine nationally, that's a lot of jobs. I was in South Dakota two weeks ago. They have 980 open jobs in South Dakota. Now for South Dakota, that's a lot of jobs, to be honest with you, because of the population there. But 10,000 is a lot of jobs. A couple things I haven't talked about, so, and you'll see 25,000 people currently employed. So there's a ratio here about your workforce supply to demand. And in North Carolina, you actually have a very low supply to demand ratio compared with the US. So that's a reason why the work that Montreat is doing, that your state is doing, is really important. Because you're already behind your peers, your other states in the United States. And then there's also another quotient here that talks about the kind of the concentration of jobs in the state. So what about, oh, and, and by the way, this is the breakdown of the jobs. Pretty much tracks what I described before, operate and maintain being the highest and securely provisioned following that and the like. So this tool also allows you to look more closely at metropolitan areas. So presumably Asheville, North Carolina is the closest area to where you live. 98 jobs, again, may not seem like a huge number, but for your community to fill those 98 jobs could be the difference between, you know, organization stock going down 4% or, you know, local or state governments being very successful. Uh, you see the quotient there as being very low. But I know as a community, you're very connected also to broader areas like Charlotte. And so now you see that number jump up pretty quickly to over 4,600 open jobs, again, with that quotient being very low. So anyway, this is a tool. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to use at our conference in a couple of weeks. We'll begin to introduce some new features, uh, such as separating these jobs by what are government jobs versus private sector jobs, and then eventually what are the jobs in the private sector according to sectors or critical infrastructure sectors. It really is an analytics tool that allows you to dive more deeply. There's another part of this tool, though, that's called a career pathways portal. Because probably the hardest challenge for us right now is getting students and others to break into the field. Because despite what I said about operate and maintain in those job categories, breaking into the field sometimes can be a challenge for students. A lot of it has to do with the HR job descriptions or the bias built in. Well, you don't have any experience. Well, yeah, you know, until I get into my job, I can't develop experience. So take a chance on me. Let's, you know, come up with some more creative ways to address this. But 
they don't want to stay in those entry level jobs forever. They want to move to mid-career jobs and advanced jobs. So there is a career pathway tool that starts to take some of these entry level jobs and allows you as a job seeker or you know, maybe as a career advisor to help students not only understand you know, what am I currently doing, what do I need to do, but what's the next step? And you'll see here, here's a salary indicator. Uh, this is not the entry level job, but it's the mid-career job of penetration tester or vulnerability assessment, which is an increasingly popular career for people to pursue. And this pathway tool, what's really exciting about it is if you're at the entry level job and you aspire to the mid-level job, you wanna know how do I get from here to here? The answer is, in small print that you can't read, the NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework tells you what the knowledge, skills, and abilities are needed to get to that next level. And whether it's your current employer that invests in you to do training, or you yourself invest to maybe get training certifications or going back and getting an advanced degree. By the way, when I talked earlier about accelerating learning and skills development, we have a lot of people with bachelor's, master's degrees going to community colleges. What are they going to community colleges for? Not to get an associate's degree. They're going there to take non-credit courses to get some new skills. Community colleges are a very important part of this ecosystem so that they can not only advance in their career, but they can kind of do this continuous learning that I've talked about. So I want to just shift with a couple things to end, and we'll have a few minutes for question. Uh, this is just a quick overview. Again, if you're not familiar with the things that NICE does, uh, we try to take a very holistic, comprehensive view of this. And again, it's not just a federal government part partnership. We partner with state agencies and state organizations like the National Governors Association, but also with academia and private sector. So we have a working group that is a public-private partnership, and it has subgroups focused on K-12 education, collegiate, training certifications, competitions, which I really haven't talked much about, but competitions across the you know, K through 12 level to the collegiate level to the workplace. Because again, another way to do performance-based assessment and hands-on learning are exercises and competitions for people who are already in the workplace. And then we have a workforce management one that is looking at some of those issues of risk management and how do we work with HR. By the way, because of the importance of HR, to kind of our strategy and, and influencing and changing the direction of cybersecurity workforce. Our new co-chair of this nice working group is an HR professional who's been in the field for almost 30 years, working with the federal government, working for a, uh, an agency, and now working in private practice, very connected with the Society of Human Resources Professional or Managers uh, to try to have some influence there. I mentioned about the different agencies we work with. We coordinate and talk on a monthly level. Uh, NICE also does uh, webinars on a monthly basis. And so this past month, we, we talked about something else that I thought was really interesting, which is people with disabilities. You know, one of our categories of underrepresented populations is what about students with disabilities? Can they fill cybersecurity careers? And last month's webinar looked at people who've been diagnosed with autism because they quite frankly are shunned they quite frankly are discriminated against, they're not provided the opportunity, but there's a lot of cybersecurity work out that they're exceptional, they're better than the average person because they bring unique skills and abilities and aptitudes to that. And so we wanted to draw attention to that as an opportunity. We also produce a quarterly e-newsletter. If you're not subscribed to it, it's just something you can sign up to on our website, which is at the bottom here, nist.gov slash nice. We try to always put a spotlight in what industry is doing, what academia is doing, as well as what the government is doing, both at the federal, state, and local level. And there's always a feature article. And then something new that we introduce once we publish the framework in August is what we're calling the NICE Spotlight Series, where we're taking people doing cybersecurity jobs and essentially starting to show how the NICE framework applies to them, what their career pathway was. And I know a lot of people doing cybersecurity work says, well, you know, I came from, you know, degree programs or experiences that weren't cybersecurity. Well, that's largely because they weren't available. They weren't an option as they are for students coming through Montree today. I think we'll see a little shift in that over time. But nonetheless, that is a reality that there's a variety of career paths to getting to cybersecurity jobs and we wanna focus on that. And then I already talked a little bit about our NICE annual event, but I also wanted to emphasize that, you know, as we've heard here, I've heard here today many times, the answer is not just with college and university students, as important that is. First of all, you need the students to fill your pipeline, and they're going to be coming from K through 12. 
but we also need to work increasingly with K through 12 to increase the pipeline of students, many of which might actually, upon graduation with high school, maybe even with that community college degree, enter the workforce immediately. So we do a K through 12 cybersecurity education conference coming up in December in Nashville, Tennessee, working with K through 12 teachers, school administrators, state departments of education, you know, really trying to influence career technical education or CTE programs at the high school level. Uh, you may also know that, you know, again, close partnership with us and NSA and NSF does the gym cyber camps that not only provide camp opportunities for students in the summer, middle school age, but does professional development for teachers. Uh, all that information is available on our website. So I just want to kind of conclude with a summary and kind of a really foundation for how I think you as a community can move forward to increasing your cybersecurity education and workforce capacity. First is that it starts with a community orientation. Now I work at the national level. I'm looking at what's happening across the 50 states. And quite frankly, there are things happening across states that are really powerful. But the bottom line is most students go to college within 50 mile radius of where they grow up. Many of them are gonna stay and work in that same community. And many of you have local economic development needs that you're trying to solve to bring jobs to your communities, to help your companies be successful, to prevent security breaches and other things that are gonna you know, lead to less profitability. So we really strongly encourage communities working together. And when I talked about that ecosystem, you know, we're here today at Montreat College, but I hope you're talking with, you know, your community colleges in the area, your K through 12 schools, your high schools, your public and private schools, and then certainly how this all connects to employers, because the second point is that this needs to be employer led. Now, we're not just talking about jobs. I know a lot of people who are academics don't think I'm helping my student to get a job. You're preparing them for a career. And I think similarly, employers are committed to hiring students that are gonna be a lifelong learner and committed to a career. And so the employer engagement, which I've certainly seen in my couple days here, is absolutely critical. So it's not just being driven by the supply side, but the demand side, the employer has a say in that. We spend a lot of time in the federal government not only doing this workforce supply work with colleges and universities, but make sure that our CISOs, our CIOs like Max, and certainly our Office of Personnel Management are heavily engaged to influence what the job requirements are. Third is it has to be learner-centered. And again, I'm probably speaking to the choir at a college or the university, but in the not so distant past, a lot of education and training was about the person on the stage, right? the sage on the stage as opposed to the guide on the side. And when I talked about the NICE Challenge Project, that's a great example where we want the learner, the student, or the employee to begin to develop skills and competencies, maybe coached and helped by somebody else. And that's a paradigm shift that certainly hasn't happened everywhere. And I really encourage you to think about how you can put learners, or in your case, students or employees at the center. Fourth is that it be standards-based. Now, I don't know how much you know about NIST, but NIST overall is best known for our title, Standards and Technology, which means we create guidelines, frameworks, best practices, standards, not only for information technology. You know, we have the standard that makes sure the clock is accurate. We have standards that talk about measurements. Uh, but in this case, we not only have the NIST framework, which is becoming a nationwide, if not an international standard for how to do cybersecurity, the NICE framework increasingly is the standard about how to define the who is doing cybersecurity. And so I encourage you to look at standardizing that because it's not only going to help you as a community, but it's going to help you within the state and then working across state lines. And then finally, that it be outcomes driven. I, I think the most important thing going forward here is that we not only be focused on all the activity and the inputs and how many students are coming into Montreat, but, you know, quite frankly, I got to evidence firsthand what your graduates are doing upon graduation. I didn't ask any of them how much they earned, but that could be some valuable outcomes information. What I do know is they are making an impact in your community, in companies, in organizations, and in government. I also heard last night about somebody, uh, a graduate local uh, from, from Mississippi, I believe, uh, who's working in my organization that you be really focused on the outcomes you're trying to achieve and so that as you describe your program, it's not just about all the things we're doing and the things up front, but what are the actual outcomes you're both trying to achieve and the impact you want to leave. So that to me is kind of a summary description of what we think makes for a roadmap to success.
So again, my website uh, for the organization, jobs heat map URL, uh, my email address, happy to talk with you later. We do have about six minutes left. I'm happy to entertain any questions or comments from the audience. So if anybody have anything they want to ask. Yes. Okay, so, so the question which I'll repeat, but I do see we now have a runner with a microphone for the next question is what do we see in the next five years from a nice perspective or from a cybersecurity education and workforce perspective, maybe with K through 12. I mean, a lot of the challenges we're facing in higher education as well as K through 12 education is gonna require a lot of systemic change. And I'll give you one example where I think we're gonna see some big difference in the coming years, which is computer science education. Now, don't get me wrong, computer science alone is not essential required for a lot of the work roles I described, but it is a helpful tool or resource or competency for a lot of students to have. And so there's been a lot of success recently in the states, in the schools, making computer science a requirement for everyone, that there's coding that's regularly part of the discipline. And as we begin to look at ways to get not only computer science, but cybersecurity more integrated across the curriculum, I think that will raise awareness. And by the way, the one thing I forgot to mention that I should have mentioned is that um, in a couple of weeks, November 13th through 18th, we'll be doing the first ever National Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week. And the reason we're doing it November 13th through 18th, it's during November's Career Development Awareness Month, where a lot of kids across the country are gonna be here about careers, parents are gonna come in, you know, teachers and guidance counselors are gonna give them data and statistics. Cybersecurity is still not on the radar screen. We think computer science for all type initiatives is gonna help bring awareness and attention to cybersecurity. In fact, we also think not only can we piggyback on that success and effort, we think that they will likewise piggyback on our success because everybody wants cybersecurity more a part of the K through 12 education. So our conference, our K through 12 group, all the work that we're doing in K through 12 is on this type of trajectory because of increased interest and kind of pressure. Yes, another question in the back. So how much of the initiatives that you're doing uh, reach over into the Department of Education and determining curriculum for K through 12, continuing education, things like that? I mean, I, mean, I imagine that there's overlap. So how much of it is going also to help develop it so that we can create that talent pipeline from day one with uh, you know, our students in public education? So, so hopefully everybody heard that and I won't repeat it, but the essential question is how much of our work is impacting what the Department of Education is doing. You might be wondering why is NICE cybersecurity education at NIST and not the Department of Education? And part of it is the US Department of Education really has somewhat of a minimal role with respect to influencing what happens in our schools. The bigger influence happens at the state and local level. And so they are a resource for giving students loans or financial aid for college. They have very little, if any, influence over higher education curriculum. And the same is kind of true for K through 12. Now, don't get me wrong, they are part of our interagency group. I would say the office we work with the most is their office on career and technical education, because that's where we think they will, I mean, Perkins grants, as well as influencing what states are doing on that curriculum. The K through 12 conference, by the way, I should also indicate that it's back to back with the Career and Technical Education Association Conference, because we think that's one of our strategic areas to partner with. So we are absolutely working closely with the Department of Education. You may have heard recently that the president um, asked the Secretary of Education to invest $200 million towards uh, computer science and coding and STEM related uh, education. And so we're working closely to make sure, and that's unfortunately not new investment, but trying to reallocate existing investment. We're working closely with them to make sure it has the best possible impact for cybersecurity as well. Yes. Well, considering you mentioned uh, this is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Yes. Um, can you talk any, about any partnership that you may be doing with the National Cybersecurity Alliance? Yeah, so um, National Cybersecurity Alliance, if you're not aware of, staysafeonline.org is kind of one of the leaders in the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month activity and in the context of partnerships and how we work with them. Uh, on, so, so this week, 
this is going to confuse you, but this is actually their focus on careers as well, the fourth week of the month of October. So on Tuesday, I did a Facebook Live session with the NCSA talking about some of these general issues and trying to get the word out across the nation. Uh, also that same day on Tuesday, the NCSA came out with a study done by Raytheon and some others looking at millennials and some of their uh, perceptions and views about cybersecurity. The, the important thing is, if you haven't checked out the Raytheon or the NCSA study, this is the fourth year they've done the study, so they've got some longitudinal data. And there's actually some indication of progress, which we're proud of and happy to see. There's also some indication that we're going backwards. And one example is women's views or girls' views in cybersecurity. It's actually not increased at the rate that it's been increasing for boys. So we do partner very closely with the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Uh, of course, they are funded in part by the Department of Homeland Security, which is another close partner of ours as well. So thank you so much. Again, I appreciate the invitation. Best wishes on the rest of your day today. And thank you to Montreat College for the invitation. And again, congratulations on being designated as Center of Academic Excellence. Thank you.